Thank you for listening and supporting The Daily Memphian. Sign up for one of our many free newsletters and breaking news alerts at dailymemphian.com slash email to receive the latest local news stories impacting our community. Our weekly newsletters cover everything from sports to arts and culture, business, food, and more, along with daily updates of all the news we publish each day. Sign up or manage your email preferences at dailymemphian.com slash email. Welcome to another bonus edition of the Daily Memphian Grizzlies podcast. You can subscribe to this podcast and all of our other Daily Memphian pods wherever you get your audio. You can always find them on our site at dailymemphian.com. encourage you to sign up for our twice-weekly Grizzlies Insider newsletter, which also includes links to all of our Grizzlies stories, pods, and what they call content these days. I'm columnist Chris Harrington. Earlier this week on this pod, uh, beat writer Drew Hill and I wondered whether a healthy Grizzly should be favored to win the West. A few days later, the Grizzlies, Grizzlies are now half a game out of first in the conference. They're in the league's top 10 um, on both offense and defense for the first time this season, and yet they are further away from full health than before. Um, they did get back reserve wing Zaire Williams on Wednesday night in, in beating the Oklahoma City Thunder, but that was paired with news that starting scoring guard Desmond Bain will be out for at least three or four more weeks. And I, I want to you know underline at least because there's no certainty on this subject. To react to that, I welcome back a recurring bonus pod guest this season uh, in the tennis volley that is our pods this week. The the ball is back on our in our court. Keith Parrish, who talks general NBA on his fast break breakfast pod and Grizzlies on his grits and grinds pod coming at us from Nashville. What's up, Keith? Hey, Chris. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. So so the medical release we got on Desmond Bain uh, after the game. Um, you know, a week ago, Taylor Jenkins had said they would have they would have a, a an update early this week. To me, once you hit midday Wednesday, you're no longer in the early portion of the week. And then he said before <laughs> the game, you know, maybe we'll have something later tonight or tomorrow. We did get it about ten minutes after the Grizzlies post game media session ended. They put, they put it out, and it says I'm going to mostly quote because uh, I think it's important to actually pay attention to the language on this. Upon reevaluation, Desmond Bain is progressing in his rehabil- rehabilitation from a right toe, uh, right big toe sprain and sesamoid, new word to me, injury. Um, he's been cleared to begin a gradual reloading protocol. If, if, I'm going to emphasize, if the toe responds positively to the reloading protocol, return to play is projected in three to four weeks. Uh, armchair sports medicine guy, Keith Parrish, what's your reaction? I mean, it's overall it's bad it's discouraging the the wording you said you wanted to be careful to get the wording right they i imagine they spent a lot of effort and energy on their wording right and the things they wanted to say and i think most people pointed out beforehand that the difference between zaire's injury update and desmond's previous injury update where they said zaire is expected back and then desmond bain will be reevaluated but this one you also throw in what I consider to be the fake phrase gradual reloading protocol. Right. That that means nothing to a human being who's not working, I guess, for an NBA team. And even then, it feels like made up speak. Um, it's not positive news. It's clearly he's struggling with this toe thing and what I've learned a, a sesamoid is. But uh yeah, it, it's it, it's bad and Yeah, I mean, we can paint like the rosy picture of that. And I know you have in your column on the Daily Memphian. I did it on my Grits and Grind show. Like there are upsides to it. Like the schedule's kind of light in the next few weeks as far as the number of literal games you actually play. But um, yeah, I I did not love this carefully worded injury update. Also, I want to know, why do you think they did the timing of this? This is a particularly chosen timing, too. This I don't, is not I don't know. just when they got the I'm, was the doctor writing up the report during the game, and then they got it during the game, and they're like, all right, now let's drop it. Well, I mean, the specific timing of doing it, like, you know, 10 minutes after the game. So, I mean, th- there's some strategy in that, I guess. But in terms of doing it yesterday versus two days before, I, I think it took them it took them that long to get you know, their ducks in a row and get all the reports back and the conversations with the doctors. And it's my understanding that on Tuesday, I think Drew and I recorded on Tuesday earlier this week. It was my understanding that on, on that day, they were actively doing medical reevaluation. 
Um, so it's not something. This is not something they've had in their back pocket and they've known for a week. I, I don't believe that. I think they were they did medical reevaluation, and and this is what they found. And and they found, you know, the, the word sesamoid, which is uh, you know something inside your toe. We, we don't get too many details here, but that is new. That was not in the earlier injury report. So this is more information in that regard. It's also more vague on that. It's a big toe sprain, and sprain is somewhat vague, but that's more specific than injury. Injury could be like anything, right? Um, I. I think, look, you know, to, to get out of the boot and to start doing on-court work is one level of progress. And so when they say there has been progress, there has been progress. Dude was walking around in a boot, and now he's not walking around in a boot. Um, but the journey from doing the on-court work to getting to the point where you can play is a separate journey. That's the journey they, they have now embarked on. And by their own admission, there's no guarantee that that journey proceeds Without hitch, uh, they they hope it does. My understanding is that they believe it does. That when they say, you know, if the response positively, he'll be back in three or four weeks. I think they believe that the if will they believe that he will respond positively. So I think they honestly believe well he's going to be back in three or four weeks. But they are acknowledging in the wording that that may not be the case. And I think a lot of people in Memphis sort of have glanced over this language and said, oh, that's a bummer. You know, it would be another three or four weeks for deaths. And we don't we don't know that. They don't know that. And they are admitting they don't know that. So as a very amateur sports um, physiologist slash, uh, you know, injury expert, one thing I do know about the human body, I hope I'm getting this correct, is the, the feet are an area in the body that have relatively low blood flow and don't heal as quickly as some other parts of the body sometimes. And that's why you get these weird, like, Hey, we thought Lonzo Ball or whoever it was, uh, like Zion Williamson had the foot thing. And it was like, we actually thought his foot would heal. It did not end up healing. And so they can be very difficult and sometimes slow to get better. Well, so, on the other hand, Jaron had a foot injury and he, he came back ahead of what most people expect. Yeah. And so you never know. That's true. That's true. You never know. Yeah. Um, so so you, you said earlier, you know, put a silver lining spin on it. I, I'll push back on that. I don't think what I wrote was a silver lining spin. It's not that there's anything good about Desmond Bay not coming back. I think it's that the Grizzlies have shown they can be good without him. But I think to be good without him, they have to have pretty much everybody else. And to me, my concern is not you don't have Desmond Bain. How can you compete? It is we got to sort of keep everybody else now. You you can't have the com. It, it makes it, it, you suffer more from the potential of multiple absences when you already have one of the one of the big ones already, you know, already on the ledger. And that, and so I, I think to me, I'm not. You know, the stat I put out was they're 13 and four this year with three of the four. And that essentially, that's not all these, but essentially that it's John Morant, what they have now, John Morant, Dylan Brooks, and Jared Jackson. And to me, though, that trio with good role players around them, I, I, I think is a team, even without Desmond Bain, that can come compete at the top of this conference. Because I think Dylan Brooks and Jaron Jackson together guarantees you high level defense as long as it's not a disaster around them. I think John Morant with decent players around him pretty much guarantees you a high level offense. I think you need Desmond Bain with him to have a top five offense. But I think this team can be a top 10 level team on both sides of the floor, even without Desmond Bain. That's how good I feel about the talent on this team. So I think they can keep rolling to some degree, even with Bain out. But I think it caps the ceiling a little bit, and I think it puts them more in danger if they have other absences, which they're probably going to have that we just can't foresee. Right. I think I could take I could honestly take it as a slightly if I wanted to do a positive spin. I do think there is some benefit, maybe long term to with Bain missing this time. It's going to mean like Roddy and LaRavia are not just kind of cast off into like barely playing roles. They're going to keep getting hands-on experience. Zaire Williams is going to get even more minutes as he returns from his injury. So maybe that'll benefit the team down the line where he will find his footing even quicker. He'll continue to improve. So the, the ability to get maybe guys lower down on the pecking order, more and more minutes, um, that could be a positive spin. If we're trying to find the, uh, the silver lining, I don't, I don't agree with you necessarily that they're still without Bain able to compete like with the other top teams in the West. I'd be surprised. I do agree with you that their defense will be still great because um, their defense has been really, really awesome since November 1st. They are, they have the third best defensive of rating in the NBA. And I think they'll, they'll continue to, to defend really, really well. We're on the upswing in these past four games where I feel like we're feeling good about a right. little better about the offense without um, Bain. I don't necessarily believe that it's going to, 
remains so rosy. I think the pendulum will swing back and we'll have some of those, you know, eight, nine made three pointer games. And, and we're playing better teams. Uh, I'm not sure the offense will be good enough. So, so the point you made a minute ago about Zaire Williams coming back, you've been playing, you, they've played, they've been playing without Bain for, for weeks now, but they've been playing yep. without Bain and Zaire Williams. And so yep. they've been getting by with two of their four rotation wings out. Now you got, you do get one of them back in Zaire Williams. And so even without Bain, you're looking at Conchar. I think Conchar is going to stay in the starting lineup. Um, I don't see that changing anytime soon. Yeah, I agree. If Conchar, Dylan Brooks, this your starters. You have Zaire Williams and now David Roddy is fourth wing. And I've been a Roddy skeptic and he has been improving. Like I'm, I'm impressed with what he's been doing the last few weeks. And so on one level, if you keep having success with that, like you kind of like having, having the, some, to some degree, you like having the excuse to keep giving David Roddy minutes because he's doing something with them. Um, at what point in this do you would you look to try to bolster yourself? Is it if you have another injury? Is it right now, or is it if you have another injury on the wing and now you know you're down two wings again? Is it if something comes back of Desmond Bain that's going to be longer than three weeks? At what point, if any, in this do you look and say, okay? Should we try to do something to add some more shooting, to add some more wing depth to this team? Because you do I still mean, have the like, Danny Green expiring to use. Yeah, you got yeah. Tillman contract. You've got you know, in terms of things you could do using either a Green or Till Green and or Tillman contract and lower level draft stuff. I I, I don't think ever. I don't think okay. they will ever do uh, a bolster move. I've I've basically. I mean, I've I've feel like I've talked about it before where I thought maybe they, like, Hey, why don't you just bring in a guy who can help here? Why don't you bring in a veteran for this? If the price is cheap. And if, if some teams become sellers at the trade deadline, if there's like a fire sale on, I don't know, like Hornets players or something, you could find someone who you might think helps. I don't think, I don't think they, they're going to be focused on that unless like the, the Bane news is catastrophic. I mean, maybe if there was another bad injury, you know, where, where you really, shorten your rotation as far as the guys you could trust. But I think now after years of them not doing it in the off season and then in, in the regular season, just depending on the next man up philosophy, I think with Zaire and with the stuff that you've seen from like even Kennedy Chandler showing up and playing and their, their comfort level of playing Tyus and jaw together. I, I, I don't know if they, I, I don't really think they will use any draft assets. And I think that any, and I honestly think, any draft assets you would send out, if you're also including the Danny Green salary, how much better does that make you over just crossing your fingers and hoping Danny Green is, is healthy, you know, in in like April? And I think because of how everyone is clumped together in the West, that I don't think they're going to be like, oh, you know, we're not going to fall out of it. I don't think, I, I, or like we might fall out into the play in, but I don't think they will, I, if the equation is, what is it worth to send out in future assets to help us win two more games in the next 20 or something, or three more games in the next 20? I don't know exactly what that equation is that the front office goes through, but I'm guessing this team who loves using the draft to add players and wants to keep building the sustained level of success for years to come. I honestly doubt that, that they would, they would make a move. We're going to, we're going to get back into that a little bit more. First, we're going to stop uh, for a word from our sponsor. This is a St. Jude moment. Ashton was a high-level athlete, and in a, an instant, your world flips, and your healthy five-year-old competitive cheerleader has a brain tumor. And the physician was like, your best option is St. Jude. Receiving treatment that was life-saving for our child and knowing that that treatment would be of no cost to us was a huge weight lifted. Learn more at stjude.org. So I agree with that generally. The one thing about this team is that I think they plan their roster in part for where they thought they were most vulnerable on the injury front, and that has not been where the injuries have come. I think they, you know, you go into the summer, sir, as you had to go into your off season, your transactional period of the off season. In terms of your core players, you're most worried about missing games from Jaron, who's already hurt, you know, is going to miss the start of the season, and John Morant, who you just assume is going to miss double digit games. And so you carry a third, you go out and get Kennedy Chandler, now have a third point guard who didn't have last season. Um, you, you get multiple, you have Santi Aldama moving up, but then you go get Roddy and, and LaRavia, who are both, I think at the time they were drafted, you saw them more as combo forwards than wings, really, but you get more depth there. Um, 
Desmond Bain of the four, even though he had the back thing in the playoffs, so the four sort of core guys was the one you, you know, rightly would be least concerned about from a health standpoint. And now that's the guy that's missing. So I think I think they came into the season with less depth at two guard than anywhere else. And I think they know that. And so that's the one thing I would wonder about. I agree that it's not right now. Um, at some point, as you get closer to a trade deadline, and I, the other part of this is I think they really like Danny Green as a guy in the locker room. I think they do value that. But at some point, as you get close to a trade deadline, like, yes, you, you care about the future, but you have to be in a right now mode, too. And so I don't. I don't know that they'd be unwilling to, you know, what can you get for Danny Green in a second round draft pick, right? Like that kind of thing. Um, let me throw some names at you and see what you think about any yeah. of these guys. Okay. So I, I, I got I got six. I got six possibilities. This is sort of in roughly reverse order of interest. Um, Gary Harris, Terrence Ross. From uh, Orlando. Zero zero interest from me in Terrence Ross. Um, the human torch nickname is one of the greatest frauds perpetrated on man. He's one of the worst three-point shooters over the past few seasons. Uh, Gary Harris, I like, but th- that's a guy with, with injury Injuries. concerns. He's currently out with that's the hamstring good, thing. Yeah, that's a guy I talked about signing as a free agent. You know, la- I believe it was last summer. No, I don't I don't think no, I don't think they would have any interest in either one. Um, I think they would much rather cross their fingers that Danny Green went healthy. Danny Green with healthy, I think it's a more valuable player than Gary Harris, just baseline. So I think they would much rather just hang on to Danny Green. All right, Josh Richardson, San Antonio. I think Josh Richardson is a great fit. And again, these are, we've talked about, we've, we've specifically talked about him before. Um, you know, I, I would be in favor of bringing in Josh Richardson right now. He would, was even, he's would you, do, even Danny, you, would you do Danny green in a second round pick or two second round picks or whatever? You're not sending a first. I don't know. I mean, I've, been, I've basically like, I don't know if I've just, um, I've just given up with my like trade dreams where I'm like, they're not going to trade anybody. They're, they're, they're going to let these guys play because I mean, here, here's, here's what I'm thinking and not to beat a dead horse, but like they had a three point shooter under contract. They had a defender under contract. They had a backup two guard under contract in Melton. They traded him for a rookie and Roddy and they traded him for Danny green. So then why would you go back and get a very similar player in Josh Richardson who similarly has struggled um, being a backup on some good teams, like he was bad on the, on the Sixers. I, I don't, I, I, I can't imagine the front office now deciding, you know what? Never mind. Let's just let, let's go get Josh Richardson. Like maybe I would, but even then, I, I feel like now I've gotten, I'll just sit on my hands and be like, I guess I trust the development of this team, not to kill your whole segment. I'm sure there's more exciting <laughs> names coming up. I'm going to see if I'll convince you on one of these. Again, I'm starting <laughs> at the bottom okay, and, mo- and okay. moving up. Uh, Malik Beasley. My problem uh, is I think the Jazz would ask for a first and I wouldn't give it to him. Yeah, Malik Beasley had a big three last on Wednesday night against the uh, the Warriors. What are the salary situations? It would have to be Danny Green and something else. It had to be else Green and, and Tillman. Else. Green and Tillman would, would get there. Green and Tillman for Malik Beasley. I mean, just as a gunner, I do think this team needs more shooting. Right. And I still believe that. And so like that is a, that's an enticing one. I like him more that he doesn't necessarily need the ball in his hands. Like a Terrence Ross needs the ball in his hands to score. Um, I like it more than like the Jordan Clarkson types uh, as a six man gunner. I, I could, I could imagine, it, I guess that this is all contingent on if closer to the trade deadline, you felt like, all right, it's, it's now below a 50% probability or something that Danny green is going to be good to go. Yeah. I, I, I would be interested in like, in like a Malik Beasley, just, like giving this team firepower, a guy also that you don't necessarily maybe don't have to play. I don't know if Malik Beasley would be okay with that. Um, a guy with, but you've given up a first round, by are you giving up a first round pick. Uh, yeah. First round pick. No, I'm out. Right. I'm good. I'll, I'll, I think I'll that's wait for whoever problem. I get with the first round pick in the future. All right. Three more. Alex Caruso. If Chicago blows I mean, it up, why but, would you trade a first round pick for Alex Caruso when you had Anthony Melton? I don't think I would trade a first round pick. I'm wondering what they're willing if they start decide to blow it up. He's got three years left on his deal at like nine million. Um, great yeah. defender, combo guard, good spot up shooter. I, I don't know. Maybe if I'm the Pelicans, I I would outbid the Grizzlies. I would throw in one of those one of those Bucks picks or something to get Alex Caruso. I think Alex Caruso would be great for the the Pelicans. Yeah, I mean it, it's an, it's an intriguing thought. Um, he could even, you know, eat into some of Dylan Brooks's minutes. 
Um, I probably wouldn't trade a first round pick. It, it just where the Grizzlies are. Like the Grizzlies, I'm thinking are about well set up right now, and and so I, I probably wouldn't spend a first round pick for what might be a bench player when you're fully healthy. Would you spend a first round pick for Chris Duarte? If Lord, Indi- no. If in- oh no, okay. Indiana looks and says no. we got Halliburton, we got Matherin, we got Nimhard. They're all 22 and under. Duarte's good, but he's tw- he's three years older than these guys, and we're building around them. You wouldn't. Yeah, do that. no. Chris Duarte's not even young. Um, well, he's he 25. To- he hasn't to me proven that he is. He, he no. I I I Caruso's in my mind a way better player than, than Chris Duarte. I, I'm not trading the Pacers any first right. round pick for Chris Duarte. Well, then I get to the I get to the one that is the one that I would consider doing. If, Ooh, okay. If you're not totally convinced Danny Green is actually going to be able to be a meaningful basketball player for you this season, and I don't know whether the Grizzlies yeah. have gotten to the point where they can know that or not, sure. but to me, it's not a given that he's going to come back from the injuries he had at the age he is. If you know right. he's not, do you flip Danny Green in, in a second-round pick or two for Alec Burks? Uh, I like Alec Burks. He's he's a good player. He's instant offense. Um, he's the type of player I feel like for years I've been talking about. Like, thirty eight percent, thirty eight percent career three point shooter. If 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 he doesn't play some night, no big deal. Like you yeah. you're, you're gonna be in the playoffs, and I don't know. You know, I know you like giving minutes to Roddy and whatever, but it's okay to have veteran shooters in the playoffs sometimes to soak up some minutes. He also would immediately become. I mean, while Bain is out, he would become the second best guy on the team at creating his own shot in the half-court situation. Like, Alec Burks can get you a basket. If it's a shot clock's running down, just get anything. He can do it. He's also really good at getting to the foul line, and he's a really good free-throw shooter. So, like, yeah, I would definitely consider, you know, if Dana Green's not playing, which we have to keep saying is the caveat, I would definitely I would definitely trade, you know, two second-round picks or something just to bring in Alec Burks because he's like a... a Instant offense, break glass in case of emergency. He's not going to kill you on the defensive end. I do like Alec Burks as a strong fit and someone who would probably not cost you very much as far as draft assets. So that that's the guy I'm looking at. I, I just think that at some point, and we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. I don't think it's I don't think we're at the point. But if the Bain thing ends up being more than three weeks, heaven forbid if the Bain thing ends up being like, you know, where it's going to impact deep into the season or beyond. Um, if some other injury pops up, there's no guarantee that like you just can't assume all these other guys are going to stay healthy. I, I think, I think, I think at some point they may need to consider you know bolstering that wing depth depending on what other things happen. And so that's a guy I'd be looking at right now. Um, what's your general sense of things? You, you are you excited about Jaron? Are you believe in his believer in his shooting yet? You were the skeptic on the Jaron shooting. I've been there, like, don't well, worry about his, it. His three-point shooting isn't high, but it's nice. Like, it's going, what, what is he like? It, it's 35%, but that includes 0 Perfect. for 7. That includes yeah. 0 for 7 in his first game back. It's like yeah. in the 40s. Uh, that's true. Otherwise. That's a good point. Yeah, he's, you know, 35% league average. No, uh, even if the three-pointers aren't necessarily creeping closer to 38, 39, all the other offense has been so good so far that, yeah, it's been really exciting. And the combination of, of that with him just doing the Jaron things on the defensive end, it's been spectacular. And that does have me in a very good mood. That has me in the mood where I'm not like, I, I like I don't need to trade for anything because where we are right now it is pretty solid, even if Bain's not playing. And yeah, I'm real excited about Jaron and definitely crossing my fingers that like this is sustainable, what he's doing right now. If it is like 18, 19 points a game, um, you know, and, and three blocks or whatever, it's, it's been awesome. So what? How do you see the West right now? Uh, I still think that the Suns are quite good, despite as long as they're not playing the Mavericks, the Suns are, are good, or I guess the the Celtics. Um, yeah, I think the Grizzlies are in a good spot where you can hang on while Bane's out to to still be close to this, you know, the Suns and the Nuggets and whoever else. Um, I would say when fully healthy, I, I trust our team over like the Pelicans, the Pelicans now right now, number one in the West, uh, very exciting for them. At what point do we start believing? I, I agree with you, but at what point do we start believing in the Pelicans? Okay. I believe in the Pelicans as far as regular season success. And with the way the West is, we're like, is 53 wins going to be the one seed, you know, or 52 wins or something. Well, I pointed, um, I I pointed out him doing that at the beginning of the show. I pointed out the Grizzlies are now top 10 on both offense and defense and one, but four other teams are too. And that's um, the Celtics, the Suns, the Cavs and the Pelicans who I believe are top six on both sides of the ball. And I didn't see their defense. The offense doesn't really surprise me. I didn't see their defense being the, do it, doing this well. And I don't quite I mean, understand been, how it has they've been taking our boy out of the rotation. 
mean, they've been playing Jonas. Jonas yeah. Less and less. They have so many options defensively. They have like Larry Nance Jr. has been playing great for him. Herb Jones is a great defender. You know, Alvarado off the bench. All those guys are good. Trey Murphy three is a good defender. They have actual good defenders. Um, so yeah, I, that number is a little surprising how high they are. Cause that was the question mark, but they are so deep that I, I do feel like, yeah, why wouldn't they win 50 something games this regular season? I mean, I was in the preseason, I was relatively optimistic, but you know, like we'd been burned so many times on the Pelicans and Zion not actually playing that we were like, all right, maybe pump the brakes a little bit. But I definitely like the Pelicans and the Grizzlies more than the Mavericks coming into this year. Right. And I'm feeling I'm feeling good about that right now. Warriors, you think they get it back together? I do. I don't know if it's just PTSD, but I have a lot of sustained um uh just respect and fear of them that I I assume at some point that Steph and Draymond will do their thing and they'll they'll rise to the top of, of the, the, the West. And so, yeah, I, I do still think that they're, they're, they're quite good. All right. Well, um, we had no Desmond Bain for a few weeks. We hope it won't be longer than that. I think it sounds like I'm a little more optimistic on the Grizzlies over the next few weeks, um, as long as they can stay healthy, in terms of the rest of the rotation. Um, but we'll see on the shooting front. I, I You know, Dylan's been shooting the ball, three ball well lately. Jaron's been shooting yes. the three ball well lately. I think they need those two guys. Um, and that is that has been a difficult thing to rely on historically. That is certainly true. Well, I would say about the, what's the last five games there? You got you got Dylan, you got Roddy, you got Ja, you have right. Jaron all making three-pointers. And it just takes like one or two of those guys to throw in your 0 for 4 game, your 0 for 5 game, and suddenly, you know, you're not winning by nine. You're in a nail-biter, a, to- a toss-up. I mean, I, again, I'm looking at the, pl- the teams are going to play and the way the games are spaced out. The Grizzlies should bank some wins coming up. But then when you lead up to Christmas, you have those road games at the Suns, at the Nuggets, at the Warriors on Christmas Day. Right. Like, are you going to beat those teams without Desmond Bain? All of them, all these games nationally televised? You may not that be, might be where I am a little more skeptical. I mean, you might might not beat those teams in those games with Desmond Bain. So, so, right, so right. we'll see. All right, Keith, tell us where um, – we're not going to do our more than life than basketball bit this week. We're going to give you a reprieve. We'll get back to that next time. Okay. Uh, well, tell us. I've been playing Tecmo, Super Tecmo Bowl is my more than life than basketball. I broke uh, up the Nintendo. Um, all right. Tell, yeah, tell you us can where follow, we can find you. <laughs> you can follow me on Twitter at Fast Break Break. Grizzlies fans, uh, subscribe to the Grits and Grinds podcast, wherever you get podcasts, and also on YouTube. And then uh, listen to Fast Break Breakfast for a bunch of ridiculous basketball talk and stories about just, you know, life in Nashville and other places. And once again, a reminder, you can subscribe to this pod if, you, if you're not already listening to it in some subscriber mode somewhere. Um, wherever you get your audio, along with all of our, all of our other daily Memphian pods, including the the uh, the um, sound bites pod, food pod that I'm also on, um, we and others that we have. Um, always find it all on our site, dailymiffian.com. Sign up for Drew's uh, Grizzlies Insider newsletter. You get links to all of our stuff. You can find me on Twitter as long as Twitter exists um, at Chris Harrington. Uh, Keith, thanks for joining us, and we'll be we'll be talking again soon. In-depth journalism in the Memphis community, The Daily Memphian is of Memphis, not just in Memphis, and seeks to tell the stories of this city. TheDailyMemphian.com. Truth in place.